All day today, I've been listening to presentations where leaders and teachers are talking about student engagement and really focusing on ways to help students um, both be more actively, authentically engaged, um, learn at a deeper level. Um, some are looking at moving novice students to the apprentice um, category. And others are looking at improving culture school-wide in, in their schools. It's been a really interesting day, a very informative day. Um, we want to share with you a project that um, is just underway. This is the first year we've started to work with inquiry um, design, the inquiry design model. This was developed by Dr. Kathy Swan at the University of Kentucky. Um, and her colleagues at two other universities. And Dr. Swan led the work um, on the national level identifying and um, developing the C3 framework for social studies. It's a very interesting framework, and I've heard others today talk about the Engage New York um, work that is on that, that uh, website. But the thing we want to talk about today is how to really lead students to a deeper level of learning through compelling questions. Had the good fortune of working with um, NASA one summer. I spent two weeks at NASA. And one of the days, um, NASA brought in a futurist to talk with us. And the futurist said, and this, this had to be 10, at least 10 years ago, but his words have resonated with me all these years. He said, the future will belong to those individuals who ask the best questions. Um, we're intrigued by both that observation from the futurist, and then we've gathered some quotes um, about questions and how important questions are. All of this will be posted on in the holler, so uh, you'll have um, full permission to use it any way that would work for you. At the heart and anchor of this model is um, what we call compelling questions. To be a compelling question, the, the, the question has to be rigorous. It can't be answered with a short answer, yes, no, true or false, or multiple choice. But it has to be um, a question that, that really involves students in thinking, problem solving, making decisions, collaborating with each other, etc. And the question to be compelling has to be relevant for students. And by that we mean the students have to care about the question. So many times, questions become something that they answer on a test. And after they, um, a student told me one time, we really, um, after the test, we forget the information. We don't mean to forget it. We just do. So compelling questions, we hope, um, will alleviate that. This is the C3 inquiry arc that was developed by Kathy Swan and colleagues and teachers across the nation. And as you can see, it begins with a compelling question, and it ends with a summative argument. Not, not a summative test, necessarily, but a summative argument, a summative task that can be used in place of um, some of the more traditional ways of assessing students. In the middle of that arc, you will see supporting questions and tasks and lots of sources, not just one source, but multiple sources, sometimes original documents, sometimes original research, etc. cetera. Um, but you'll see lots of information that students will dive into in answering the compelling question. All of this is designed to help students climb up this ladder from just recalling information to actually applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating a product in a summative sense. Here's one quick example that came from the Engage New York website. 
C3 Teachers Network. You can go there and find all kinds of great um, units that have been developed and vetted by several professors and um, peers. Um, this one is a seventh grade social studies question, can words lead to war? Seems like a simple question, but really when they dive into it and they start to analyze resources and they start to take a position on can words lead to war, if you th by your research think that yes, words can lead to war and they have led to war, or no, Words can't lead to war, and here's the evidence I'm using to support this position. This complete unit um, will have supporting questions, will have resources, and again, you can find these resources on the C3 Teacher Network. Now, this is a social studies unit, um, and while we know that the compelling questions are very tough to get them right. They have to be vetted, they have to be, um, they require a lot of collaboration, but we also need to know that students can be a part of that process, and Lisa is going to talk about how um, the QFT process that many of our teachers have been trained in really connects well with the inquiry design model. This complete blueprint for can words lead to war consist of one page. You'll see the compelling questions, you'll see the supporting questions, you'll see the resources, and you'll see the um, uh, summative products or the summative task. All of this, again, you can find on the network. It's an honor to introduce the inquiry fellows to you. These inquiry fellows have attended training this summer. Uh, some of them have been to four days of training with Dr. Swan at UK. Um, but also, they have stepped up to the plate to say, I want to try this. I want to develop some of these units. Now, let me tell you what's unique about this group. They're not only developing social studies units. They're developing units across the curriculum. I don't think there's any other group of teachers in the state or nationally who have agreed to do that. And I could not be more excited. Dr. Swan at UK could not be more excited. And uh, these units will be published um, after they are, are vetted a little bit more. And we'll be back in April to let you know how that goes. So um, Lisa Salyer is the Technology Integration Specialist in Johnson County. Uh, Tara Howard, math teacher in McGoffin County. I'm sorry, did I say McGoffin? Um, Lisa is in Johnson County. Tara is in McGoffin, teaching math elementary. Jessica Francis, McGoffin, teaching social studies. Georgia Baldwin cannot be with us today, but she's a high school social studies teacher at Painesville Elementary, uh, Painesville High School. And uh, Kayla McKinney is in Floyd County, and she's a high school English teacher. So Lisa, We'll start uh, talking about the unit she's developing with an arts group of teachers across the curriculum. Thank you, Linda, and thank you for your leadership. We uh, truly appreciate all your guidance. <clears throat> well, what I'm going to speak to, first of all, is uh, designing collaborative projects across the curriculum, just like she was talking about using the IDM process. First of all, this... Um, when we started this summer and we were at the, the, the training, I thought, well, this kind of just fits right to, to me because when I started teaching, this is in the time of Kara and we were all about thematic teaching. So we really didn't know any other way to teach other than teaching, um, across all content areas. So it just fits, you know, nicely, I think, for that. Um, even so much so that our principal at the time, he relocated our whole primary school so that we would be located around the library so we'd have all the, the literature just at our fingertips. And he always had intentional time set aside for planning and it was intentionally planned and aligned with the arts and humanities, the music, the physical education, and the librarian. They all met together with us uh, in our planning time. So we taught collaboratively, I guess, my whole career. That's the, kind of the only thing I knew 
to do. So when we got a chance to design this project, I thought, well, this fits exactly with uh, thematic teaching and, and units. Um, <clears throat> I think the biggest difference now than before was now that we have so many more uh, technology resources available. And so you'll kind of see that embedded into the, the, the IDM that um, we've created. The student benefits of this is that it obviously increases student engagement. And I can say that from uh, just thematic teaching. It's so much more meaningful to students. And uh, it promotes critical thinking skills. It increases oral and written communication skills. <laughs> Um, collaboration skills, it ignites student creativity, and it increases the depth of knowledge. And cross-curricular connection also allows for authentic learning opportunities. Educator benefits, teaching standards and a method that allows, again, for those cross-curricular connections that are so meaningful to students. Teachers have meaningful collaboration with peers, and we create a shared uh, vision of our resources and you'll see with our IDM that's that's our whole mindset it is working together and not this is mine and I don't want to share I think that's the biggest thing that we've thought about is taking others ideas and welcoming those um, instruction is carefully intentionally planned to focus on formative and summative tasks and most of all it's fun it's fun for the educators it's fun for the students and it's very meaningful so what I thought about is when I joined this, um, when Dr. Franz invited me to join the IDM, I thought about how could we make sure the IDM was making a difference? So sure, we can say we're doing this cool thing, but is it going to make a difference for students? So I use this as part of my um, action research grant. And so the project that I actually designed was to compare traditional instructional practices, project design, and presentations to those produced by IDM. So then the results are going to be compared using student interest surveys, self-peer and teacher and summative performance task evaluations, comparing beginning and ending digital port presentation portfolios, and the project will be evidenced by increasing student interest surveys again along with those student peer and teacher evaluations, teacher observations, and analysis of the student presentation portfolios. And, and that'll make more sense when you look at our IDM and what our task is actually going to be. So um, you already have a copy of the IDM? Did you already pass that out? OK, so I was fortunate enough this summer to meet some great new people. So we, we were um, at our training, and we were uh, assigned to groups based on our grade level. So I'd like to introduce to you here. Um, Patty Dye, she worked collaboratively with me on the project along with um, Renee and uh, and I also want to mention um, Ryan New, which is working on this uh, project with us in order to vet it to be put placed into the C3 teachers so everyone will have access to this. So as you see this IDM, it's an ongoing blueprint. So we're, we're still working on it. We're still making adjustments. And it looks so simple. It looks like one page, and it looks so simple. But I will tell you, after two days, I was worn completely out because we struggled so much with these questions and make these questions intentional, making sure that the resources were vetted and making sure that they were what they need to be is it. it Although the simplicity is what seems great about it, and when you're sharing that with others, that's wonderful that we're, you know, but you have to realize how much time, thought, and effort goes into these projects. It's certainly not simple. It's, um, a, it's a, a, a great task. So our compelling question was, how does Appalachia make me unique? And so we went ahead, and of course, everything is standard driven, so uh, we have our standards aligned to our, um, to the whole IDM. And, Speaking about using QFT, um, I, was, I always like to think about how everything fits together. So rather than taking things in isolation, it's just like with, with the grant I wanted to do, I wanted it to make sense and meaningful for, for, for me and the students. So using QF, QFT, I thought, was, would be a great way to generate student questions um, about Appalachia. So to begin, Ours, we're going to use QFT to generate questions about Appalachia. And the Q focus was go is going to be a painting. And this painting is going to be of a barn dance. And so students will start generating questions along the way. Now, what I want to make sure that I do is I stop 
Although I have a set of intentional questions I want my students to address, I want to stop along the way and make sure that I'm address addressing those that are generated by my students as well. So I think it fits nicely together. So rather than having things in isolation, I'm all about making them work together. And so um, Patty's going to uh, talk about our supporting questions and our uh, formative task, and then we're go going to look at some of the featured sources. Hello, thank you. Uh, yes, taking from what Lisa has said, there's so many things about Appalachia, and um, it was hard at first, you know, to think, how can we narrow this down to just three questions? And we tried to consider, well, what do we really want them to focus on after they've considered all their own questions? So the supporting questions, as you can see on the blueprint that we finally arrived at was, uh, what are three traditions unique to the Appalachian region? And we really wanted to have the children focus on the rich literature that comes from Appalachia. So the formative performance task would be preview, preview the Appalachian literature and we would have an array of books and materials there for them to, to first look at themselves. And then list three traditions of the Appalachian region depicted in that literature and then develop a claim about the positive or negative ways Appalachia is depicted in literature. And this led us into a discussion of we really want to focus on the positive. The negative will come up, the stereotypical things, and we can't ignore that, but we want to rise above it was our message for the children. Supporting question two, um, what beliefs, language, and traditions are showcased in Appalachian music? And music is such an important part, and we wanted to, to use that to bring out the beliefs and the language and all those other wonderful things. So we, ha we were to have them look at um, lyrics from music, read the song lyrics carefully, and then summarize and write sentences on how each song reflects life in Appalachia. The supporting question for three, uh, how do art forms depict life in Appalachia? You can't look at just literature and music and, and not look at all the wonderful art and crafts that we have here in this culture. Create a list of types of artwork in Appalachia and describe how they reflect life in Appalachia. So we're getting a good wide variety of all the wonderful things in just three supporting questions, but it was, it was challenging to, to narrow that down, but it, it really um, brings it all home together there. And I'll let Lisa continue with our sources. She has a good background with those. I've used a lot of the literature sources before, but one new one that I'm so excited about is uh, the Mommy Goose Rhymes from the Mountains by Dr. Mike Norris. Dr. Francis shared that with me, and speaking to the compelling part of this, as she was talking, we want to, to focus on the positive aspects, but in the back of the book, it starts looking at more of some of the things, and we will look at with our older students about black lung and some of the things that may be not as positive. So we will look at those things, but we'll do that by age-appropriate levels. Um, feature sources as well, we want to look at lyrics from like Loretta Lynn, Dwight Yoakam, and Dewey Moore, some local artists. Um, and with the other sources, we have quilts, dulcimers, and baskets. And uh, collaborating with the art teacher, we're actually going to be doing an Appalachian um, a, a program this winter. And so we're going to incorporate this unit with that. And so we'll have a, cul a culminating uh, performance, and you're all welcome to come to that. That will be in um, probably early December in Johnson County. Um, so leading up to this, so all the formative tasks, they lead up to our summative performance task. And so they're going to actually be constructing um, an argument. And this argument will be about how Appalachia makes me unique. And they're going to address that compelling question using specific claims and relevant evidence from current and historical sources while acknowledging alternate views that they will be exposed to along the way. Now, coming from the technology side of this, I wanted to make sure that I incorporate that in here as well. So they will be having an opportunity to do digital posters, uh, Vokies, Glogs, Google Slides, video presentations, digital brochures, and um, different things that could incorporate that. Not saying that they have to, but they'll have a student choice as to that. 
Also, to extend this, and I think this was uh, Ryan knew, he, he had some wonderful uh, examples of how to uh, extend this project. They're going to research ways and methods in which public and private groups depict the culture in Appalachia. And they're going to examine the Appalachian Regional, Regional Commission's Visit Appalachia website, and they're going to assess the extent to which they are reflecting Appalachia and the culture. So I thought that was taking it to a higher order. So I like to see that. They could, two co possibilities, maybe organize a culture day that addresses different facets of uh, Appalachian culture, or maybe even to write a letter that addresses the needs what needs to be changed on their website to reflect a more accurate picture of Appalachia. So I thought that was very strong there. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. This is, gonna, this is kind of coming out of the blue. And I'm, I'm really impressed with the way this organizes this whole arc of inquiry to uh, an ownership by the kids and then the, the ability to talk. So my question, and maybe you could answer it on a continuing from, that might be interesting to sound like a total frame um, which is in Perry County, we're implementing a three-year uh, initiative in schools, starting with middle schools, oriented around um, more physical activity, both in and out of school, and also, also nutrition and, and paying attention to your health in both those areas. We're looking for ways to put this in the curriculum and teach it across the curriculum. Is this a tool that we could use the same format to design you know, the compelling questions, standards, staging it, supporting, formative, and so on. I mean, could, could, this, could this be a way of making this meaningful for the teachers as well as the students, even though it's not just a particular class that kind of cuts across a large picture? I certainly think so. Don't you? Would you like to speak to that, Dr. Friends? Well, I think so, too. And I think the teachers <clears throat> can best speak to that. So why don't we let Tara talk about how this, how she's incorporated this process into math. So, and you can see across the content areas. Okay. Um, it's a good question. We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, I'm Tara Howard. I'm from McGoffin County. And as Ms. France was saying, um, I am. Sorry. I'm not doing I can't get it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I am kind of pioneering the way in math, um, no pressure, but um, I am really trying to um, figure out how this fits into math. And I do have one example, and it hasn't actually been vetted, but Kathy Swan has looked over it, and I do have some handouts. <clears throat> and I guess the reason uh, being that this hasn't been really used in math before, this model, um, when you look on the C3 website, you'll notice that it's, it mostly um, goes along with social studies or that's the way it's been used. And I think maybe because that stigma with math and, and the way that math has always been taught, um, direct instruction, that lecture style math, just teaching the algorithms, and it's not um, thought of as I guess something that you could you could do inquiry with, but that is not the case. Um, inquiry has been used in math for several years, but this is really just a model that we put that in. And so, okay, I'm all the way back at the front. That's okay. All right, and so. Um, we, we traditionally have used worksheets and, and workbooks, and we want to move away from that. Some people have, but uh, we really want to move away from that and look more at collaborative learning instead of independent learning. And so this quote, I automatically thought of it when I thought, what quote can I use? And tell me, I'll forget, show me and I may remember, involve me and I'll understand. And with math, that's what we want. I get the question a lot, the why. And this, this really, um, addresses a child's natural curiosity. And children are always asking me, since uh, I am their math teacher, they'll say, why do I need to know this? How am I ever going to use this math? And so I think when you, you tie this into this model, you are getting those students involved in a real world application. You're showing them how they will use it. And so it also makes it very relevant. And when you stage the question, after you, you come up with your compelling question, you must come up with a way to stage it. And when you stage your question, you are really tying into that pre-existing schema. You are looking for something to make that relevant, to get that lesson started, kind of like a hook in language arts. You're really trying to pull them in. 
And so how do you begin? Because with math, since it is really um, something new with this model, you, you first just think of something relevant that will go along with your math standards. When you get that question, then design your unit around that. Your tasks align that with that question and those content standards, and it will fall into place. Um, student results. Students, and they will get into exploring the content deeper. They will want to uh, make connections with other content standards. They, they really get engaged with this. And so it's, it's real world and they will understand why. And so that's the main thing. And for teachers, it's a time saver. It's all on one sheet. Um, you have everything on there that you need and it's, it's, really, it's really a time saver. And students will walk away with something other than the drill and kill that we usually associate with math. And so um, I'll talk to you a little bit about the lesson I have. Since it, is, it has not really been vetted, I don't want to hand it out. But um, so the compelling question, I did um, a unit over the last few years, actually, I've done it every year, where students get into understanding decimal operations um, by talking about money and careers. And so the compelling question is, what are you going to do with all that money? And to stage the question, students create a classroom store, or we create a classroom store where students are given a certain amount of money, and then they get to purchase items and understand what happens when they may not have enough money. And they're given jobs, they get to develop a budget, and we tie in the ELA um, with, um, they get to make an argument about what they want to do, if that career will work for them. And also, it's extended um, by creating an advertisement for a bank that would inform others about good um, financial literacy. And so, this is really something that's new, so I am in the learning process. But um, I hope to have more for you in April and maybe have some students with me that can talk to you about some things we've been doing. Okay, and Jessica? Okay, um, I'm Miss Francis. I teach middle school in McGoffin County, and um, I have the benefits of getting, I think, what this just was designed for. I've taught social studies since I began educating 10 years ago, and the good and the bad thing about that, I love history. Uh, the bad thing is that all of my kids, sadly, do not love it the way that I love it. Um, yeah, it devastated me for a couple years, too, but very sad. But this is, how do I get them to love it? or to even pay attention to it and to get them excited about it or to even pay attention to me while I'm sharing my love for it. The material that I chose was something that I thought, I knew my kids had a background in it because I knew this was my first um, time using the IDM template, so I wanted something that wasn't totally new for them because it was new for both of us at the same time. I wanted to get them engaged, something that they were thinking about and how it did it matter to them. I can go in there and tell them a bunch of dates. I can tell them definitions. I can tell them people. They don't care. If it's not happening to them and not, it does not affect them now, it, it doesn't matter. So that was what I loved about this when we first heard about it and we first kind of figured out what we were doing with IDM. It was, wow, this might actually make them care about this and make them take some ownership about what they're learning and what kind of products they're creating from it. So that was my big thing as far as benefits. They got engaged. And it wasn't just remembering a bunch of days for a test because that's always their favorite question. Is this going to be on the test or how many points is this worth? And I wanted them to think a little bit more beyond that. Um, Cross-curriculum, when I show you guys my example, it doesn't look like probably what you would think of for a middle school history class. I teach a ton of economics, um, which worked really great with Tara was talking about the things that she did with her classroom store. I teach my kids about taxes every year. They have no idea how they work, um, and that's part of their standards now and part of the new social studies standards. And it kind of blows their mind that there's different types and that they do different things. So when we actually got into um, the lesson, the first part of it asked them, is the national economy hurting your allowance? They don't care about the national budget. It doesn't affect them because they don't have paychecks. You know, they're 13. <laughs> they care about their parents, though, and they care about 
their parents buying them stuff. So when we started with this question, it kind of got them thinking like, wow, that really does have an effect. Like I said, it was information that I was teaching anyway. Um, when we met a couple of days ago and talked about how we were doing with these lessons, and my biggest thing was you can sell this to classroom teachers. I am a classroom teacher. This is not something that is making you do extra work because I think as teachers that's the first thing that we usually think of is that's going to take me too long. That is something that is going to make my life harder. This is stuff that you are teaching anyway. And this is stuff that will also make your kids more excited about it though. So it's kind of win-win for everybody. A good point that I thought Tara brought up, one page. Um, I took a unit that I had already been teaching, changed it to where the students were actually making their own questions and they were taking some ownership of what we learned and what direction we went in and they got more involved that way. And I think that's kind of a win-win for everybody. So I think student engagement is probably the best thing for as a student benefit and as an educator because if you've got them involved you have done something wonderful especially at 13 <laughs> so it's kind of a mini miracle um, I think that using this especially as social studies teachers it just falls so easily into it um, I love hearing what how it goes so well across the curriculum we our school is focusing on our reading and math scores right now just because they are horrible. Uh, my kids, their writing skills, they, I mean, they struggle. Um, I blame a lot of it on texting. I get U's and R's. <laughs> the U and R is letters and not speeches, or they're words, not letters, speech all the time. But I want them to write, but I want them to want to write. Listen, when, you get done, when I got done with this, when I got done with telling them about different types of taxes, they were opinionated. They were very strongly opinionated about what they thought, about when they wrote a letter to their president about why taxes should be the way that they were, they meant it. And they kind of got really into it, and I, I'll take that all day. If it's a one-page template can do that for my eighth grade kids, I said I'll, I'll put everything in it. Um, I'd love to get some students back. I don't know if we'll actually bring students. I'd love to get at least some interviews of them to show you guys in the spring and show some more units. One thing I know for sure I would like to change or do further than what I did with this one was to give them more of a choice. I kind of guided them in the product that I wanted them to create. Um, I let them go with it. We worked together to create the questions, but I want them to, now that they've kind of got that part down, I want them to work and figure out what kind of product works for them. Because as we all know, every product doesn't work for every kid. So I'd like to give them some more student choice. Internet access on your laptop? I, I don't know. I haven't tried it. Okay. I was going to bring it. That was not. Again, Kayla McKinney, um, Floyd County. And uh, Kayla has been to four days of training, I believe. Um, after only two days of training, she picked up the ball and started to run with it even before the inquiry fellows were identified. And um, she wrote a blog about it. Her blog caught the attention of professors at UK, uh, Kathy Swan, namely. And Kathy encouraged her to publish her blog on the C3, the national um, C3 network, which she did. And uh, it's been widely, um, that should come through. Widely read and um, hopefully she'll be doing much more training on this in the future. Do you know? Technology issues. Okay, so I went to the training back in, uh, this was in the spring, and I have seniors and freshmen. I teach high school English, and uh, in the spring, seniors are coming down with senioritis, and they're ready for school to be out, and they're not wanting to be there. And so when I went to the training as she was going through, um, one thing I always struggle with is how do I make this relevant? Because not all of my kids are going to go to college. Not all of them care about, you know, college English. And uh, one thing I love about the IDM is it's built into it, the relevance. It's built into the plan and how you have to think about it. And so as the training was going, I started thinking about this unit. Why am I here? And I went back to school. I did the unit with my kids. And it was all about why do we have to have English for four years? 
because that's always the question. I already know how to speak English. Why am I in here? Uh, so it kind of focused on that, how it affects them. We are in a poverty. You know, over 70% of our school is free and reduced lunch. So I did a little article on that. And it brought in a lot of different curriculum, too. Uh, like with the poverty, we used a, an article, and it was very social studies. And so we were able to pull in some different stuff. And I think it brought my kids back on track, but also it brought me back a little bit because we get, get so stuck in – what we're doing and I'm doing it this way and nobody's listening to me anyway and I'm just going to keep going and so it kind of made me stop and made me change and uh, from there I just I, I actually emailed Kathy Swan was like this was just an awesome training you know it revived me basically and they asked me to write a blog and that's on uh, c3teachers.org so this is a unit that I have uh, for my seniors they read Lord of the Flies and Lord of the Flies it's it's a good book you should read it it's it's pretty good. Um, but Lord of the Flies is this book. These kids get stranded on an island, and they basically have no adults with them. And so they have to decide. And I started thinking about, in English language arts, as far as IDM, you have to think about, well, really for anything, why am I teaching them what I'm teaching them? What What's the purpose? Yeah, this is on their curriculum, sure. But why am I teaching it? What do I want them to get out of this? And I think that's where, that's what I really love about the IDM. It really makes you think about that. That's not, it's not going to cooperate with me, but that's okay. That's on my website. It has like all of my compelling questions and everything. So I started thinking about the Lord of the Flies and I thought about it in that instance. What exactly are they supposed to get out of it? And that led me to these questions, which strangely enough ended up being the themes of the book. So it just worked in so perfectly with it. Um, and one thing I love about the unit is, it, with our election coming up and with seniors, almost all of my kids are going to be voting. Uh, and so one thing that they do with the unit is they look at what are the admirable qualities of a leader. It's something I would have never thought about for the unit without IDM, but you really have to think about where our foundation's coming from. So they look at the presidential candidates. My kids are actually working on that now, and they present on both candidates in an unbiased form, and then at the end, they form an opinion on what they think. So I thought it was just a good outlet to um, to think of. The IDM, you come up with one compelling question. I think that's kind of what we were talking about. That's the tough part, because you really have to make it so general and we're so used to like being so specific, but you have to back it up. And it really engages the kids because they get involved with it. They care where their allowance is going to be cut, or they care about who's going to be the leader of our country, you know, especially my ones that are going to be voting. And even one of the questions I did with them, what constitutes right and what constitutes wrong? And at first, you know, they, they didn't really know what to think about that question when I asked them, what do you think, where, do, where does this come from? Our idea of what's, what's right. And we looked at moral dilemmas. We looked at the Heinz dilemma, which is a, a very famous dilemma. And they talked about their ideas on it. They got to argue with each other. Uh, my kids are in groups and they had a really, they had a good time with it. But at the same time, they learned about the Lord of the Flies and they connected it back to the reading. And one thing about language arts, I think with IDM is you have to read the book first. That was my first question. How am I supposed to do this if they've never read the book? So we read the book first, then we go back to this. So I think it's a, it's a real game changer for the classroom. But also, I think with what you were saying, I, th I think it would go perfectly with that. Because this kind of helps you think about how can I relate it? Or what, what's the big question here? And that kind of leads into how it can relate to other subject areas. Uh, so my website's mckinneyenglish4.weebly.com if anybody wants that. The lesson's on there and it's, it never gets deleted. And also I have the why am I here too I can send out uh, to people. And I think it's on C3 maybe. Questions? Okay, thank you. mckinneyenglish4.weebly.com We invite you back in April. Um, our teachers will have some of their students here to talk about the unit. Um, they'll be showing the, the products, the, um, the arguments that they've created. So uh, we want you to stay tuned. And in the meantime, we want to share the work. Um, even though some of these questions haven't been vetted wild, widely enough, we're, we're open uh, to sharing whatever has been created and we will look forward to doing more of that sharing and we invite your teachers um, I have 
at the end of the PowerPoint, I have the email addresses for each of the presenters. Please feel free to contact them, contact me. Uh, we'll get some training for you. Whatever you need, we're, we're here to help you in whatever way we can. Please join me in thanking the Inquiry Fellows. And 